Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I am here with part 11 of reacting to your football hot takes. Like always, a couple of days back on my community tab, I asked you guys for some of your hottest takes in regards to the beautiful game. And like always, bro, you guys did not let me down. I want to take like a minute to say this. I know it's going to sound a little cheesy and most people will probably skip the intro, but I need to express my gratitude to you guys, bro, very briefly here because the community tab post got nearly 600 responses. And that to me is insane, bro. The fact that you guys love this series so much, like it just, I love it, bro. It, it makes me so happy because I love making these videos and the fact that you guys are obviously engaging with the content and doing all that stuff, it honestly means so much to me, man. I promise you guys, I never take this stuff for granted. Uh, I'm truly so thankful for every single one of you guys that submitted your hot takes, that interact and engage with the videos. I promise you guys, man, I truly do not take this stuff for granted. And you know, I appreciate you guys so much, man. I think I have honestly the best viewers in the world and you guys, are just the greatest, man. Again, really cheesy. Most people don't like hearing stuff like that because, again, it can be kind of awkward. But I would be upset with myself if I didn't come on here and just express how grateful I am towards you guys. But yeah, man, enough of all that stuff. Let's let's actually get into the video and react to some of these hot takes because this is probably the best batch we ever had. There's so many great ones, so this video is going to be a, probably a little bit longer. Uh, but yeah, man, enough yapping. Let's get into the hot takes now. The first take we have here is a long one. The Messi-Ronaldo rivalry was fabricated by the media. Never was Ronaldo individually better than Messi. His Ballon d'Ors came from team accomplishments. If it was based on stats, GA, Messi would have won every Ballon d'Or aside from 2013, from 2009 up until 2019. Look, I want to say this first of all. If you guys followed me on TikTok before I ever made it over to YouTube, you know I kind of made my, my name, if you want to call it that, doing the whole Messi versus Ronaldo debates. And obviously, being a Barca fan, I'm on Team Messi. He's my favorite player of all time. And as a lot of you guys know, not the biggest fan of Ronaldo. But takes like this, I don't agree with them, and I will never agree with them. They kind of rub me the wrong way because I feel like people don't really un understand how good Ronaldo was in his prime. Like, it was definitely a rivalry, bro, because look... I watched it. I'm fortunate enough that I'm old enough to have watched Messi and Ronaldo in their prime when they were both obviously in La Liga, one for Real Madrid and one for Barca, and it was definitely a rivalry. Now, do I think Ronaldo was ever better than Messi in any of those years? Absolutely not. I always thought Messi was the better player, and, and I will always believe that Messi's the better player, but it was definitely a rivalry. And when you talk about GA, yes, Messi always had better GA because Messi was obviously a more complete player. He will always be a more complete player than Ronaldo, but Ronaldo was still keeping up kind of close to Messi when it came to GA. Go look at Ronaldo's 2014-2015 season. I think he put up like over 70 GA in that season. He was fucking insane. And look, bro, they're both, they were both in a, in a room by themselves in their prime. It was Messi and Ronaldo, and everybody else was fighting for third place. It was definitely a rivalry. And when it come, when you say about the team accomplishments, yes, that's true because Ronaldo was winning the Ballon d'Or when he was winning the UCL, but that's usually historically how it happens. And also, those teams don't win the UCL if it's not for Ronaldo. And those moments that Ronaldo had, you can't just take them away. The bicycle kick against Juventus, you can't take that away. You know, the, the brace against Bayern Munich and the hat trick against Bayern Munich, offside goals or not, you can't take that away. The hat trick against Atletico Madrid in 2017, you can't take that away. The hat trick against Wolfsburg, you can't take that away. The double against Bayern Munich in the Allens Arena in 2014 on the way to winning La Decima, you can't take that away. You know, those moments matter, but there's a re like moments in football are really important. Messi won the World Cup largely because of the moments that he had. And obviously, I think he deserved the ball on door. So for me, again, I don't think saying that just because, you know, again, you can't just look like you got to look at what the team accomplished as well. Again, do I think that's the best way to judge players about like based on team accomplishments? No. But when it comes to the ball on door, that's always mattered. So for me, again, I watched them both. And look, I think people look at Ronaldo now. They got to saw against Slovenia and against France. And they're like, how the fuck did this guy ever compete with Messi? How were they ever in the same category? And I'm here to tell you, bro, if you watch them in their prime, you know they definitely competed against each other. And I watched them both, like I said, and, and as a Barca fan personally, in their prime years when Barca and Ramadur came up against each other, I shot my pants every time I saw number seven. Every single time I saw Ronaldo. Because he could do what he did against uh, Barcelona uh, when he did it in the Mestadia in 2011 in the Copa del Rey final, when he stopped Barca from winning a treble, what he did in the 2018 Super Cup final when he came off the bench and scored that goal and held up the shirt and then got a red card for pushing the ref, and then in 2013 also in the Super Cup. I mean, so many moments in my head that I can remember. Like, Ronaldo's record against Barca isn't great. Obviously, his goals and assists, but he always always had those moments, but those moments where he could just take over a game, and he was a guy that, he wasn't like an honest day player, he's not like Paul Pogba, Ronaldo in his prime for about 13 years, every single time he stepped foot onto the pitch, he was basically flawless, just like Messi was, and again, there's a reason why, like the biggest compliment you can pay Ronaldo is that he was in the conversation with Messi for all those years, and he was in the conversation, but I'm not going to sit here and be ignorant and say no, he wasn't, because I believe that he was, because everything I just outlined, 
The dude was unplayable. He was a beast. And again, the man you see now is a shadow of himself. And the man that you've seen for the past couple years is definitely a shadow of the Ronaldo that we saw in his prime. But then again, he is 39 years old. 24-year-old Ronaldo was a beast. 20, like fucking, dude, 35-year-old Ronaldo, 36-year-old Ronaldo was still one of the best players in the world. So for me, again, you don't win five ball indoors and you're like, you're obviously in that class, man. It was definitely a rivalry. And I think Messi would say, would say so as well. So again, uh, as big a Messi fan as I am, I can't agree with this take because you got to put respect on the man's name because he was that good. Like you, he, he was competing with Messi when they were both at their peak. It's just a matter of fact. The next take we have here is if Raimel Falcao stay healthy, he could have been a generational talent. I think Raimel Falcao, even with his injuries, I still consider him a generational talent. I believe that R9 obviously is a generational talent and he obviously had his career de derailed due to injuries as well. Same thing with Paul Pogba and a lot of these players. Uh, so for me, again, Raimel Falcao, even with the injuries, I consider him a generational talent because he's simply one of the best strikers that I've ever seen when he was at his prime. When he was in his prime from about 2010 to like 2014, those years, he was insane, bro. He was arguably the best striker in the world. And that was in a time where Van Persie was still playing and Luis Suarez was obviously at his peak and, and Slatan was at his peak and all these guys, bro. Like, he was that good. Ramel Falcao at Porto was a beast, obviously won a Europa League with them. Then he goes to Atletico Madrid. And it was just, I mean, this guy made the FIFA Pro 11, I think in 2012. The whole Pro 11, like the 10, like of the 11 players, 10 were Barca and Real Madrid, obviously, because I was the peak of Barca Madrid. And the one striker, like I said, it wasn't Slatan, it wasn't Van Persie, it wasn't Luis Suarez, it, was, it wasn't Karim Benzema, it wasn't any of those guys. It was Radamel Falcao. He was a fucking monster, bro. And if, if he would have been healthy in 2014, I think Colombia could, could have gone to that World Cup final. That team was that good. And so it's, it's a shame that he missed, obviously, that, that, um, that, that tournament. But yeah, to me, bro, when I watched the MFL Connors Prime, obviously, he played in La Liga for the, for like, like his prime years, in my opinion, when he was at Atletico Madrid. Oh, the hat trick that he, that he scored in the Europa League final against Chelsea, a fucking insanely good hat trick. Uh, when I look at him, again, I think he was a generational talent. Again, he wasn't, he, he could have been more than, than what he was, but when you look at him at his prime, there's very few strikers in the history of the game that had a prime as good as Ramel Falcao. And I will stand by that statement because if you watch him play in his prime, you know, that's not a crazy thing to say. The next take we have here is Laporta because of everything he has done and won with the club is undoubtedly the best president in Barca history. I 100% agree with this take. And as a lot of you guys know, I've been very critical of Juan Laporta's tenure, like second tenure as Barca president because I, a lot of the moves that he made kind of pissed me off. Like, you know, obviously the not, not re-signing Messi and how that whole saga played out when we thought Messi was actually going to come back. But then the rug gets pulled from under him and Messi was willing to take a pay cut, but Laporta didn't. Like, it was just a whole situation that was weird with that whole Messi thing. I didn't like the way that was handled uh, personally. And also, most notably, the whole situation with Xavi where you you beg him to come back, you're dick riding him for like four months to come back, and then because he made comments that were factual, you decide to publicly embarrass a club legend and fire him when you already when he already decided he was gonna come back after you begged him to come back. So again, those things piss me off. And also the Vitor Roque thing, because obviously that was mostly Chavi's fault because Chavi didn't want to play him. But then again, why is the president signing someone and allowing a player to come in that the manager doesn't want? Again, it was like the, the whole the, the second tenure, he's, he's had some good moments, but also a lot of like questionable moments. But again, in my lifetime, he's the best Barca president that I've seen. I can't speak to obviously 30 years before, like 25 years before, maybe 25 years before that, because obviously I'm not old enough for that. Maybe some older Barca fans watching this video can let me know in the comment section down below. But that I've seen, I mean, who's, who's he competing with? Sandro Rosel and Juan and, and, and Bartomeu. Oh my God, bro. He's by far and away the best that I've seen. And you could argue he's the best in Barca history. Two of the biggest moves, two of the biggest moments in Barca history are because of Juan Laporta. The year before Juan Laporta became president, Barca finished sixth. In La Liga. Six. That's, that's, that's unthinkable for Barca nowadays. And when he came in, what did he do? He signed Ronaldinho. One of the biggest moves in Barca history. He also appointed Frank Rijkaard, who, granted, Rijkaard finished badly at Barca, but still, he is a guy who won a UCL for Barca. Barca have won five UCLs in their history, and one of them was thanks to Frank Rijkaard. Also a guy who won league titles and won a Copa del Rey. So obviously, that brought Barca back to relevancy. The, the appointment of Frank Rijkaard and the bringing, and the signing of Ronaldinho, which was done by Joana Porta, brought Barca back to relevancy. And then also, probably the biggest move in the history of Barcelona, and maybe you could argue, one of the biggest moves in the history of football was the appointment of Pep Guardiola. That was a huge risk at the time, bro. People forget, Barca the year before, under right guard, like I mentioned, he finished poorly because they went trophyless. They didn't win a single trophy. And that was still with a good team. That was Messi when he finished third in Ballon d'Or voting. That was basically prime Xavi Iniesta. That squad was good. And they went trophyless. Obviously got, got knocked out in the semifinals of the UCL by, by, uh, by Sir Alex Ferguson's Man United. And then what does he do with that squad? Like you have this prime squad ready to be like, to be like, to, 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 to have, to be taken over by someone who obviously has the experience. And there was talks about Jose Mourinho coming to Barca. Obviously a guy who had won the UCL already, a guy who was experienced. He was arguably the best manager in the world at the time. And what does Juan Laporta do? He doesn't appoint Jose Mourinho. He goes and appoints 
Pep Guardiola from Barca B. Talk about a risk, bro. Talk about, like, you, you wanted to point at the Barca B manager, and he took over and basically created the greatest club team that any of us have ever seen. I mean, that's remarkable, man. That is a remarkable thing that he did. And that to me, I will always be grateful for, for, for uh, I will always be grateful to Joana Porta for that because that is insane. The, the, the signing of Ronaldinho is great. Obviously, the appointment of record is amazing. The appointment of Pep Guardiola, that risk that he took, bringing in a guy from Barca B with that squad and to basically hand him the keys and say, go do what you do. And he won a trouble his first year. Obviously, Pep proved him right with the appointment. But yeah, to me, bro, I think Joana Porta... 100% agree with this take. He's the best president in my lifetime, at least. Again, Sandro Rosell and Bartomeu are not going to be in that conversation because both of those guys, especially Bartomeu, to me, weren't really great presidents. Uh, but yeah, Joana Porta, man, again, take a second, like, a second stint at Barca manager, as Barca, I keep saying manager, as Barca president aside, because like I said, I've, I've already um, outlined my issues with what he's done. But when he first came in, I mean, this guy transformed Barcelona into the club that it is today. And Barca will not be what it is today if it wasn't for Joana Porta. So I agree with this take 100%. The next take we have here is if Vitinha were in Man City, Madrid, or Barca, he would be considered a top five midfielder currently. I don't know about top five because I feel like there's a lot of great midfielders currently in world football. But he would definitely be talked about a lot more. I think Vitinha, obviously, I watched him last year with Messi at PSG, and I thought he was awful, one of the worst players on that team. He always, I, I, he, he, I got so frustrated watching him play because it always seemed like he made the wrong decision with the ball, and just his positional awareness was fucking terrible at times. But when I watch him now, bro, when I watched him against Barca in the UCL, obviously um, scored two goals against us, I'm pretty sure, uh, broke my heart, Vitinha, and then I saw him in the Euros. He was arguably Portugal's best player in that whole tournament. He was fucking amazing. And again, like I said, had a great season for PSG. Had one of the best seasons that a midfielder had this season for PSG. Uh, so for me, I 100% agree. I think Vitinha is one of those guys that, again, he's not going to be talked about as much because PSG play in league 1. He's going to be talked about even less next year because PSG is not going to have Kylian Mbappe. And that's basically the only reason why people talked about PSG in the first place was because they had Mbappe, the best in the world. But I do think that Vitinha, if he, play, if he did play for Man City or Madrid or Barca and he was in the spotlight week in and week out, he would be talked a lot. He would be talked a lot, a, a, about a lot more. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, for me, I agree. I think Vitinha on the ball, he's great, man. He's gotten a lot better at reading the game. Uh, he's 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 a good player. He's a very very good player. Again, do I think he would be top five currently? Probably not. I think he's just right outside of the top seven, top eight. But he would definitely, like I said, be talked about a lot more. The next take we have here is Messi's goal against Mexico is arguably the most clutch goal he scored and the most important goal. You know, at face value, this sounds crazy because that goal was in the 64th minute. But when you look at the context behind that, I'm going to agree with this take, bro. I 100% agree with this take because keep in mind, bro, this is 2022 World Cup, obviously. Probably going to be Messi's last World Cup. Coming into it, he said, it's probably going to be my last World Cup. You lose the first game, and you, you lose your first game in like five years to Saudi Arabia of all teams. You're, so you're already starting off the group bad. You got to win this game. If you don't win this game, you're, go you're gone. You're out of the Qatar World Cup. And Messi, we're, we're never talking about him being a World Cup winner again. And people are going to shit on him and say, you see, he choked once again. Couldn't even get out of the group. People are going to flame Messi if they lost that game. And that game was a deadlock, man. 64th, 64th minute against Mexico. Mexico had created a good amount of chances. Argentina as well. It was, it was a pretty tight back and forth game. Like Messi, Mexico and Argentina usually play those types of games. And then Messi picks up the ball right outside the box from a pass from Di Maria and scores and scores a banger, a banger to the to the obviously to the to the post. They just like a pass Memo Ochoa, a beautiful goal, one of the best goals that I've ever seen Messi score. I mean, that goal was just it was amazing. And again, it is the 64th minute, but when you look at the context behind it, if that goal, I don't think Messi scores that goal. I don't think Argentina win that game. They needed, in that moment, they needed a goal. And again, Messi scored so many clutch goals. Like we saw, obviously, in 20, like in 2017, when he scored that goal against Madrid and held up the shirt. There's countless other goals that obviously I can't think of right now. But Messi, obviously, we know he's one of the clutches, if not the clutchest players in the history of football. But this goal, when it comes to like the context behind it and what it meant for like, not just him, but for his country, I'm going to have to agree because again, 64th minute, I know there's like 30 minutes left in the game. But I mean, if he doesn't score that goal, if he doesn't have, if he doesn't come up with that moment of brilliance, I don't think we're sitting here talking. I don't think we're sitting here today talking about Argentina and Messi being World Cup winners. So again, I'm going to agree with this take because again, um, it was just, it was, it was a brilliant moment from, in my opinion, the clutchest player of all time. So I agree with this 100%. The next take we have here is Vinicius is three years away from surpassing Neymar's legacy. This is a tricky one for me because, again, you're talking about legacy, not as a player. I don't think Vinicius will ever be better than Neymar as a player because I think Neymar, as a football player, you know, when it comes to, like, on the pitch, not accolades, but on the pitch watching him play, he's one of the five best, best players that I've ever seen in my life. Again, he didn't win a ball indoor. Talk to your mom about that. I'm sure she cares more than me. Watching him play, I, when I watch Neymar play, he's one of the five best players that I've ever seen. Again, maybe I'm too young to have watched, I don't know, fucking Romario or Pelé or definitely too, too young to have watched Pelé or all these other guys, but that I've seen, Neymar's in the top five. But again... 
Legacy is different because Vinicius Jr., when it comes to winning, he's going to win more than Neymar because he's already probably won more than Neymar. I mean, Vinicius Jr. has already won more UCLs than Neymar has won. He's obviously a multiple time La Liga winner. Obviously, Neymar was as well. Obviously, a Copa del Rey winner like Neymar. Neymar won a couple of Copa del Reyes too. But look, bro, Neymar, like, look, Vinicius Jr. is going to have a better winning legacy than Neymar because he's going to win probably five UCLs. And that Madrid team, bro, he's already won two. I mean, who's, who's to say Real Madrid not going to win the next three UCLs, adding Mbappe and assembling the super team? They're probably going to do that. They're going to win a UCL. They're going to win multiple UCLs in the next 10 years, in my opinion. I don't know how many, but they're going to win multiple. And obviously, that's going to help Vinicius because he is obviously a part of that team and one of the best players on that team. And he already has, in my opinion, a better UCL legacy than most guys. Not the Neymar, but, the, but than a lot of guys. So again, when it comes to winning legacy, sure, but when it comes to a footballing legacy, a footballing life, Neymar is one of the most iconic players in the history of the game. After Messi and Ronaldo, you could argue Neymar is the third most iconic player ever. Again, I'm not saying best player ever. I'm saying iconic. Like, people fell in love with the game because of Neymar. People forget how good Neymar was at Santos. He was a phenom at Santos, bro. A phenom. I'm not, I'm not using that term lightly, by the way. He was a phenom, bro. He took the world by storm when he was at Santos with his fucking hair. And, and, and I think he had the nose, remember the nose tape. And he won the Puskas Award. Vinicius Jr. Doesn't have, he doesn't have that. Like, people talk about aura. Neymar had that aura, bro. Vini, I love him, okay? I think he's a great player. Again, I, I, just, I just said I love him to a Real Madrid player. But I do think Vini's that good. I think he's a great player. I think he gets so unfairly scrutinized at times because people don't realize how good he is. I think he's a, like I said, one more time, I think he's a really, really good player. He doesn't have the aura that Neymar had. Neymar had a different aura, especially at Barca and, like I said, at Santos. When he went to PSG, obviously, that kind of made his career go downhill. But when it comes to, again, a winning legacy, Vini's probably going to have a better one. But a footballing legacy, Neymar has, Neymar has one of the best footballing legacies of all time. The next take we have here is Ronaldo is the greatest Premier League player of all time. And people who say Thierry Henry have no ball knowledge. Now, look, bro. There's two things we got to talk about here. Number one is, who is the greatest player to ever play in the Prem? And number two is, who is the greatest Premier League player of all time? Who has the better Premier League legacy? Who is the, the, To answer the first question, who is the greatest player ever to play in the Prem? The answer to that question is Cristiano Ronaldo, because to me, like I said earlier in this video, he's the second greatest player of all time. But he's not the great, he doesn't have the best Premier League legacy of all time. Henri has a better Premier League legacy than Ronaldo because Henri's greatest moments came in the Prem. Ronaldo's greatest moments came in Real Madrid. And that's crazy to say because Ronaldo, like, he obviously won a ball in Dora United. You could, but people would say that his peak was 08. I vehemently disagree with that, with, with that take. I don't think his peak was 08 at all. But again, he won a ball in Dora, won the UCL, won every single individual trophy you could win. So I get why people say that. But again, his prime to me, his better years were Real Madrid. And, and most of his iconic moments came while wearing a Real Madrid shirt. Not a United shirt. Again, he had a lot of great moments with United, like the goal against Porto, the goal against Arsenal in the UCL. But his greatest moments, in my in my opinion, came with Madrid. Like I said, Henri is the opposite. Henri's greatest moments came from came with Arsenal. Now, obviously, he won the UCL and won a treble with Barca in 09. But still, that's not like I think. Henri was just better. He was he was a more iconic player while he was at Arsenal. And that's why people regard him as the greatest Premier League player of all time because he made his legacy in the Premier League. Ronaldo made his legacy in La Liga. So again, I even think that, that a guy like Sergio Aguero, obviously he's not a better player than Ronaldo, not even close, but I think he has a better Premier League legacy than Ronaldo. I think a guy like Wayne Rooney has a better Premier League legacy than Ronaldo. You know what I mean? So when I look at it like that, I mean, again, there's two parts of the question. Who's the best player to play in the, to play in the Premier Ronaldo, who has a better Premier League legacy? Him or, or, him or, him or him, oh my God, him or Henri. I'm sorry about that. I would definitely lean towards Henri because everything I just laid out. The next take we have here is extra time should be removed in favor of going straight to penalties. Most of the time, extra time is just boring to watch as players are moving slower due to being tired. I 100% agree with this take. There's a lot of new rules in football, like new things in football that people that like these federations are trying to implement that I fucking hate. Number one, I hate this new uh, Champions League format. I fucking despise it. I think it's stupid. I hate the fact that we're adding more teams to the World Cup. I think it's goofy. I think the addition of VAR has made football somehow worse and more unwatchable. I'm not a huge fan of that. So again, there's a lot of things with football that have been added to the game that I don't like. This is not one of them. This is a great take, bro. Like what they're doing in the Copa America is fantastic, man. It's so it's like most of the time, extra time is fucking boring. And if you're gonna add extra time, make it to where like if a team is up one nil and like in the first half of extra time, there's no second half. You know, if a team scores a goal in the first half and they're winning, and, but like when the half is over, you don't have to play a second 15 minutes. Or make it to where it's like it's just one 15 minute period and then you're going straight to penalties. Please, bro, because so many times we're watching these games and there's like 30 extra minutes and you're just sitting there saying, why the fuck am I watching this? It was the same, like, that's what happened with Portugal against France. Like, no one wanted to see an extra 30 minutes because the players, like, the game was already shit. 
and the players are even more tired and they're gonna play even worse. So for me, again, I 100% agree with this take. If you're gonna if you're gonna change it, make it to number one. If a, if a team scores in the first 15, you don't play the second 15. Obviously, they're winning. Or make it to where there's just one 15 minute period, and then you go straight to penalties. But having 30 extra minutes, you, dude, you know how long fucking 30 minutes is? Having 30 extra minutes of football, like when the players are, are clearly not like in the condition to play 30 extra minutes, and most of the time, like he said, obviously in this take, it's boring. It's just not a pleasing viewing experience to me, at least. Again, people might disagree with that, but this is one thing that I 100% agree with. Again, I don't like a lot of the new things that they're adding to football, but this, I will definitely back. I love what they're doing in the Copa America. I think it's amazing. Again, people might think it's unfair because, you know, penalties is more of like a like a look of the draw type of thing. It's not really who's the better team. But, but bro, I'm not trying to sit there and watch 30 minutes of teams just going, like, not even trying to attack because they're so tired. So, for me, and most of the time, extra time, teams play for penalties. If you guys watch extra time, like, a lot of times, it's just playing for penalties. So, again, for me, if you removed it, I think it would be a lot better for the game and a lot better for the players as well and their long-term uh health the next take we have here is Carvajal is arguably top five right back of all time this i'm gonna agree with it bro honestly i am because when i think about fullbacks right the best fullbacks of all time there's not a lot of names that come to my head when i think like i think fullbacks when it comes to like depth of like historically great players it has the least amount of depth out of any position in football in the history of football like when you think about center backs think about how many great center backs you can name off the top of your head just off the top of my head uh, Puyol, Pique, Ramos, Varan, fucking, I don't know, Van Dyke, Terry, Fernand, Yapstam, Vidic. You know, there's there, the list goes on and on and on. You know, uh, Golin, Jose Maria Jimenez. I mean, I can't, Jose Maria Jimenez. I, don't, I can't believe I just named them in that, in that same conversation. But anyway, there's a lot. My point is, there's a lot of guys you can think of. Like, right when you think of best center backs of all time. When it comes to fullbacks, and I'm talking about left, obviously left back and right back, there's not a lot of names. And when I think about right backs, the first names that come to my mind when I think about best right backs of all time are Cafu, Dani Alves, and Philip Long. But after that, I mean, you could, that's three right there. And then after that, who is it? It's Sanetti, Javier Sanetti, who I think was a really, really good player. Obviously, a treble winner, a treble winner with Inter. You have Gary Neville, overrated in my opinion. You have Trent, who I think deserves to be in that conversation already. You have Kyle Walker. You have, you know, you have Turam. I think you could definitely put Carvajal in that conversation with those guys. I don't think it'd be crazy to do that. I think Carvajal, is, he could definitely sneak into a top five. And I think you could, if you did it, he could be as high as four, man, in my opinion. I don't think he's going to be, I don't think he's as good as Cafu, Dani Alves, or Philip Lam, because I think those guys are, are, are just better. But with those next guys, he's definitely, he definitely has a case to be better than all of them. I mean, Dani Carvajal was a starter for Madrid in 2014 in that La team. And he was a starter a month ago in the final in Wembley and scored in that game, scored the go-ahead goal and had a great UCL campaign overall. I mean, he had a lot of big games in that whole run. I mean, the guy, you, you, like, the best way I can put it is this. Dani Carvajal has been a starter for Madrid for the, for over a decade at this point. And we know Madrid, they're a team that's always looking to improve. It doesn't matter how good you are. They're always looking to replace you. That's just the way that it is. You have Vini, we're going to bring in Mbappe. We don't care what position you play. We're going to bring in someone to compete with you because that's what we do. We're, we're Real Madrid and we're, we're always looking for the best. He was never replaced on that team. Never. There was never even a thought about replacing him because he was that good for that long. So again, when I look at Dani Carvajal... I look at a guy who's been so consistent for so long and also like he's a very very good player like on the ball he's very very good defensively he's very sound as well and he's always fucking he's never tired bro always has those, has those sleeves uh fucking lifted up like he, he always wears the sleeves up he's always running up and down the pitch never gets tired uh when i watched him in his prime i thought he was fucking amazing again do i think he's as good as the, the guys that i mentioned earlier like uh Dani Alves and Cafu and Lam like i said no but in that next like it could, could he be in the top four or top five a hundred percent because like I said, this guy's been amazing for over a decade at this point. The next take we have here is Belgium golden generation was more success than failure. They play a good tournament until they hit the eventual winners. No, we are not doing this. I am not allowing people to rewrite, rewrite history on Belgium's golden generation and how much of a disappointment it was because that's what it was. Roberto, Roberto Martinez and those players were disappointing basically at every tournament that they played. And by the way, to this point that you made, they hit the eventual champion, they hit the eventual winners. That only happened, I think, once in 2018 when they played, obviously, France and Russia. And that was probably their best tournament as a, as a unit. 2018 in Russia, where obviously they knocked out Japan in that crazy game where Chadley scored that last minute winner. Uh, and then obviously beat Brazil, a really good Brazil team in that, in the quarterfinals as well. But then obviously, like I said, lost to France, the eventual winners. But that was basically, that's the only time that I can remember that they lost to the eventual winners because in 2016, again, with their golden generation at the Euros, that was to me their best chance to win a tournament. You got knocked out by fucking Wales, bro. By Wales. And Wales, as we know, didn't go on to win the whole thing. They, they lost in the next round to Portugal. You lost to Wales. You let Robson Kanu fucking spin you in the box and score a goal against you. A banger, by the way. And granted, that Welsh, that Welsh team was good. They beat them 3-1, by the way. It wasn't like a, like Wales pummeled that team. They were a good team. They had obviously Ashley Williams and Davies. And they had obviously, like I said, uh, not like I said, they had uh, Aaron Ramsey. And they obviously had Gareth Bale and Robson Kanu. They had a good team. Okay. There's a reason why they made it to the semifinal. But that team, you had no business losing to them because you had 
arguably a prime. You have Kevin De Bruyne, not really peak, peak Kevin De Bruyne, but entering his prime, already one of the best midfielders in the world. You had peak Eden Hazard, you had Fellaini, you had Witzo, you had Vertonghen, you had other world, you had all these different guys, and you couldn't even like, dude, you couldn't get past fucking Wales. You couldn't get, you couldn't get past Wales, bro. So again, to me, I, like, those are to me the, the, like their the two best tournaments. Like when it had, when it came to having a chance to win something, 2016 Euro and 2018 World Cup, and both times they came up short. They could like they, they just came up short both times. So to me, I'm not gonna let people rewrite history on the whole Belgium golden generation. It was 100 percent a failure, and it's still one of the biggest um, underachievements in the history of football, in my opinion. The fact that that team couldn't even make a fucking final of a tournament, could not even make a final, which is criminal. And finally, if Messi had signed for Man City at the time instead of PSG, they'd have had multiple Champions Leagues by now. You're talking about obviously when Messi left Barca in the summer of 2021 when he went to PSG, which to me, even looking at it now, in the moment I thought it was crazy that he was joining PSG. Now, obviously that team had Paredes and, and Neymar and Di Maria, obviously some of Messi's closest friends, but still, you don't make a football decision based on where your friends are playing. In my opinion, I think that was a big mistake by Messi going to, going to PSG. I think he would have gone to Man City, which we know Pep would have welcomed, welcomed, welcomed him sorry, at Man City because Messi was still the best player in the world, in my opinion, when he left Barca. I mean, that team would have been unplayable. That Man City team made, obviously, the UCL, uh, what did they make? The UCL semifinal ended up losing to Real Madrid, that historic Real Madrid team that obviously uh, just had one of the best Champions League runs of all time with Karim Benzema, obviously. But you can't tell me that if Messi was on that team, they lose to Real Madrid. They, 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 they almost beat Real Madrid without Messi. And Messi, like I said, and that team, bro, with Pep and those players around them, it might, like Messi was at Barca playing with fucking Mengeza and Des. Imagine him going to play with, with Rodri and Gundogan and, and, you know, Grealish and De Bruyne. You know, Holland still, Holland obviously wasn't there. But still, bro, you, you could have played Messi as a false nine. That would have been must-see TV. I think, honestly, I, I do think Man City would have won a couple of Champions Leagues with Messi. I think they would have won the one that year with Real Madrid won it. I think they would have been the best team in the world. I think they would have won the one. I think they would have won, they would have won the one. That's kind of like a tongue twister, a mouthful, if you want to call it that. That's gross, you fucking pervert. Uh, but they, I think they would have, um, they would have lifted the trophy in 20. 23 when they obviously beat Inter as well. I don't think they would have lost that one even like if Messi was on that team. So I'm gonna agree with this take. I think if Messi would have joined Man City instead of PSG, they would have won at least two, two like they would they would have at least two Champions Leagues by now. One more thing I want to say, guys, before we end off the video: takes like this. I'm not like guys. I'm looking for hot takes. Don't go on my don't go on the community tab post and just state the obvious because I'm not gonna pick your take. This is the prime example of a take like that you shouldn't be typing in there because again you're gonna look like a fool. Michi's the most attractive man alive, bro. Again, like I said, I'm looking for a hot take. I'm not looking for you to state the obvious. But no, seriously, guys, I do appreciate you guys watching up until this part of the video. I love every single one of you, man. Again, like I said in the intro, I promise you guys the support is not, I do not, I do not ever take it for granted. You guys honestly mean so much to me, man. I truly love every single one of you guys. Thank you to everybody who, everybody who submitted their hot take. Sorry about that. Uh, if you, if you submitted a hot take and it wasn't featured in today's video, then I promise you it will be featured at some point. Do not be sad. Do not be discouraged. But yeah, man, I love every single one of you, like I said. Uh, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace out.